Hello and welcome to the event today. Uh, it's now the LSE public event on Duck Rabbit, What Drives Our Polarized Culture? I'm Simon Hicks. I'm the Harold Lasky Professor of Political Science at the LSE and also the LSE Pro Director for Research. I'll be handing over shortly to my LSE colleague, Paul Dolan, to moderate the discussion. Paul is a professor in the Department of Psycholo Psychological and Behavioral Sciences at LSE, best-selling author and host of the Duck Rabbit podcast, which explores topics that typically polarize opinion with members of the public academics, commentators, politicians, and activists. The podcast series is part of our Shaping the Post-COVID World initiative, convening a debate about the direction the world could and should be taking after the COVID crisis. Um, we're joined today by a fantastic panel of experts from neurosciences and social sciences, and I'll introduce them very briefly before handing over to Paul. First of all, we have Lasana Harris, um, who is an Associate Professor in Experimental Psychology at University College London and is a social neuroscientist who takes an interdis interdisciplinary approach to understanding human behaviour. His research explores the neural correlates of personal perception, prejudice, dehumanization, anthropomorphism, social learning, social emotions, empathy and punishment. Anil Seth is Professor of Cognitive and Computational Neuroscience at the University of Sussex and founding co-director of the Sackler Centre of Consciousness Science. He seeks to understand the biological basis of consciousness by bringing together research in neuroscience, mathematics, artificial intelligence, computer science, psychology, philosophy, and psychiatry. His new book, Being You, A New Science of Consciousness, will be published in autumn 2021. Jennifer Sheehy Sheffington is Associate Professor in the Department of Psychological and Behavioral Sciences here at LSE, researching the interface between psychology and society. Her research includes how socioeconomic status and inequality shape basic decision-making processes, as well as the psychological underpinnings of ideology and what this means for intergroup conflict and political polarization. Tiffany Watt-Smith is reader in cultural history at Queen Mary University of London, where she's also director of the Center for the History of Emotions. Her books include Schadenfreude and the Book of Human Emotions and her TED talk, The History of Human Emotions has been viewed more than 4 million times. If you'd like to ask a question today, please do, do so using the Q&A function. Please let us know your name, affiliation and location and keep your question brief as we're keen to get in as many questions as possible. You can ask your question at any point during the event. If you're tweeting about the event, please use the hashtag, hashtag LSECOVID19. Over to you, Paul, and I'll return at the end of the discussion. Look forward to it. Thanks. Brilliant, excellent. Thank you so much, Simon. Um, and welcome everybody. It's fantastic to have, have you all here today. We're gonna to, um, we're gonna do a few things today. We're gonna to have a poll at some point. And also later on, for those that wanna to, want to see everything go horribly wrong, we're gonna do a word cloud uh, live on air. For the first time, the LSE has done this. So thanks to the LSE for using me as the guinea pig. Um, so stick with us for that. Um, first of all, I just wanna, I mean, all of you may not be familiar with the duck rabbit illusion. If you're not, you can obviously quickly type it into Google and uh, it will, it will show you an image um, that is both a duck and a rabbit, um, but you can only ever see one at any one time. And probably when you first look at that image, you'll only ever see one of those animals. You need to expend effort or someone will need to tell you uh, that it's the other animal. And it's actually a very nice metaphor for how we become polarized or take sides on many issues. Once you see it as a duck, say, you surround yourself with people who see it like you, um, you find evidence that supports that it's a duck. You find ways to get rid of evidence that says it's a rabbit. So in the end, you can't imagine how anyone could see it anything other than as a duck. Um, and actually, not only how anyone could see that image or issue as a duck, um, but that if anyone sees it as a rabbit, then they're probably wrong about not only that, but about everything else besides. Um, so um, we're going to get into these issues in much more detail. Um, but I just want to just ask the panel very quickly about it's just about whether we can ever really, once we've made our minds up about something, can we ever really uh, change it? And if we can't do that, is there, can we be more accepting of the fact that people might see that image differently? Um, Jen, it's actually nice to be on a panel with you for the first time, I think. Um, so why don't I start with my LSC colleague and just a few, just, just a sort of opening salvo uh, uh, on that issue. Yeah, um, I mean, I think, Probably the way I look at some of these issues in my own research is just thinking about, well, what are people doing? You know, they're all figuring out how to live together in society where people are fighting over resources and over power. And there's a lot of different interests that gets mingled up with that. There's different preferences for how how we should be doing that. You know, what do you think about inequality? There's also different um, lived experiences that everyone's got. And so I think with if, if you start off from having different ideological preferences 
Turns out you then choose environments that enhance those preferences and that gives you different lived experiences, which then will shape your decisions. So, so we all, even though we're all in the same society, we end up living in very different worlds. Um, and when you see it from that point of view, I think it makes a lot of sense that, um, that none of us are looking at things the exact same way. And yet we're very, very invested in looking at them in the particular way that we do. Yeah, okay, cool, thank you. Um, Anil, let me come to you next. Thanks, Paul. Uh Actually, I think it's maybe more than a metaphor, this duck rabbit uh, illusion. My work as a, as a neuroscientist is trying to understand how we perceive the world. And the lesson that, that seems to be emerging from loads of research in this area is that what we perceive and what we take to be real, most importantly, is the brain's best guess of what's out there. It's, it's a construction. And the fact that you can see the duck or rabbit only one way means that sort of one interpretation uh, is, is winning out. And for me, this is, I think, even more dramatically illustrated by this, this other internet phenomenon, the dress that was both uh, you know, yellow and white or, or black and blue, right? This took over uh, the world a few years ago now and actually sparked a whole line of research. People really, once they saw it one way, they found it very difficult to even imagine that people could see it another way. And this is just at the level of perception. And of course, our beliefs about the world are built on how we perceive the world. So... I think there's a continuity. It's, it's actually a, a real insight into the into shared mechanisms at work when we form perceptions of the world and when we form beliefs about those perceptions. Brilliant. Thank you so much. There's so much that I want to ask both of you. Uh, let's let's just get these introductions. Uh, I say out the way sounds sounds rude. Uh, let's let's just do these introductions and then we'll and then we'll move on to some issues and maybe even start a poll. Lasana, let me come to you next. Thank you for being with us today. Thanks for having me, Paul. And I don't want to sound boring by agreeing with the other two panelists, but they're exactly correct. I think psychology is very unified in this issue, right? Reality is constructed, right? It's not a reflection of what you're actually seeing out there. And a bunch of other psychological processes are constructed as well, right? So memory is constructed, it's not a file draw. So when I recall a previous incident, I'm going to recall it in a way consistent with my beliefs and my preferences. Um, and you can go through psychological processes like that. And so from that point of view, it's very easy to understand how two people can look at the same thing and see two very different things. The interesting question, I think, if I would toss one back to you, Paul, is whether those beliefs matter. Do you think those beliefs are really central in driving people's behavior? Or do they represent or are they symptomatic of some other type of phenomena or, or core mechanism that we should be focusing on? Who said you could throw something back to me? I mean, honestly, that's not that's not what's that's not what we're doing. Um, let me let me let me take some time to think about that, and uh, maybe maybe we'll all uh, deal with that issue later on. Tiffany, can, anything to say that might be in disagreement with anything you've heard before? Uh, you're on mute. That's that classic line. You're on mute. Sorry, I thought it would be um, happening automatically. For some reason, um, I don't want to disagree because I think. Uh, what I've heard is exactly right, but I did want to pick up on a different question that you asked, which is, can mm. we ever, mm. um, can we ever override or kind of move beyond these kind of polarized um, ways in which we sort of interpret the world and see and construct the world around us? And I think this is a really, really significant and important question to ask and try to answer. And from my research, which is about emotions and about trying to understand you know, to pick up on what's just been said, why it does matter, uh, whether we see the duck or the rabbit. Um, I think that what really matters here is for us to try and understand much, in much greater depth, the emotional investment we have in the ways in which we kind of form ourselves into these polarized groups and understand precisely what emotions are at work. You know, there are the obvious ones like hate and anger um, and rivalry, but there are also the, the ones that I'm very interested in, like schadenfreude, this very small seeming emotion, which actually plays a huge role in, in, in helping us form ourselves into groups and, and, and creating these rivalries between us. So, so, so my um, opening gambit is to say, that I think we need to pay a lot more attention to the emotions around these um, these groups that we get into um, in order to try and therefore find ways of kind of moving beyond the, that polarization. Tiffany, I'm really sorry. I missed the end of what you what you had to say, but we'll obviously have that recorded and so I can listen, <laughs> listen back. Um, let's do the polls. Um, let's go to two poll questions. I want to... Um, Sort of following the themes that I develop a bit further in Happy Happy Ever After about the stories that we tell about the lives that we 
that we think we and other people should live. I've, 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 I've long been fascinated by, by why we care so much about what other people do and think and the ways they act, like seemingly disproportionately to the impact that it has on our own welfare. Um, and so we've got a question to begin with that is uh, along those lines, which is something that I learned during the course of this uh, podcast series is that, is that people really care about the answer to this question, whether, whether it's acceptable to, to put pineapple on pizza. Um, and so for those that have been kind enough to join us live today, <laughs> I was wondering why they did that after I disappeared for five minutes. Um, but um, for those that have been kind enough to join us today, I would very much welcome your responses to this question. And, and be honest, because I know that it matters to you. Don't say that you don't care, because I've never, I've never found anyone that doesn't actually really care about it when they um, think about it. So is it, is it acceptable or is it unacceptable to have pineapple on pizza? Or do you want to go for the boring third option and say, persuade me? We should have some answers coming in now, I think, if uh, things are working. I was uh, teasing the LSE about tech, and then that's always going to come and bite me in the ass by disappearing myself. Well, there you go. So we've got um, pretty split split opinions, pretty much a third, a third, a third, roughly, whatever, between it being acceptable, unacceptable, and people that needed to be persuaded. Um, I'm not sure which way they want to be uh, influenced, whether they want to be told that they shouldn't have it or should have it. But anyway, let's move on to the second question, uh, which is actually, uh, you know, I mean, these are all very important questions, but this is the, this is a really interesting one, I think. Um, uh, so my friends, let me just, uh, let me just read that out because we're going to need this for the recording, I realised, because we're not going to, no one's going to see any of this <laughs> when it goes out. Um, so my, my friends tend to have the same views on me. At the same, let, me start, let me start that again. It's a fantastic thing about edits. My friends tend to have the same views as me on important topics. And you've got three options. Most of the time, sometimes, or never, which you could take to be hardly at all. So most of the time, some of the time, or hardly any of the time. My friends tend to have the same views as me on important topics. And again, be honest, as if you wouldn't. Wow, amazing. Yeah, thank you. I mean, that is, that's, that, this is a super interesting answer, set of answers. So we've got 54% um, of people saying uh, most of the time, 45% of people saying some of the time, and then just 1% of the population of our sample saying hardly at all or never. Um, and well, that's that's what we want to uh, that's what we want to get into. And that's like that is the um, illustration of the duck rabbit is that you 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 see the image one way and then you surround yourself with people who see it similarly. It's much easier for all of us to be around people that nod their heads rather than shake them. And so I want to I want to sort of explore that a bit a bit more fully with with uh, with with each of our panelists. Um, and I'm going to come. I'm going to. I think I'll um, start with you, um, uh, Anil. Um, so I just want to say again, it's actually really. I'm actually really really looking forward genuinely to your book coming out, uh, being you later this year. Um, just from your perspective as a neuroscientist, um, what do you think is going on here? So I think it's pretty clear that that you know, that once you've got a frame of interpretation for events, it's 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 natural to find to, to seek confirmatory evidence. We we sort of look for information that supports our point of view, and th this is just uh, evident in so many different contexts. I and mean, when we have a colloquial term for it, we have this idea of echo chambers. So we'll tend to reverberate around the echo chambers of our shared beliefs. But I th you know I think that the key for me is that to try and understand the parallels between that and just basic perceptual mechanisms. In a sense, we all inhabit perceptual echo chambers as well as social echo chambers. So we, you know, from very basic things like how we sample our environment by moving our eyes, you know, we'll do that largely to confirm what we believe is, is out there rather than uh, disagree with what's out there. So we, we will tend to, you know, we can 
boil this down to some very, very simple paradigms. And in terms of how you then think about changing um, your mind about things or, or making yourself more open to changes of beliefs, I think it's all, for me, it's all about metacognition now. And this is a bit of a technical word, but what I mean by that is that you know, we, we have beliefs, we have perceptions, but we also know that we have these beliefs and we know that we have these perceptions. We can, if you think about it, we can judge how confident we are for those polls we just had. We could have asked people to rate their confidence in that belief. You know, I, I, I love pizza, but I'm not totally sure or something like that. Um, and it's by recognizing that we have this reflective capability uh, that we can apply to our perceptions and beliefs. I think that opens the, the space uh, for, for, for potential change. So actually something like that, that dress, the yellow and gold dress or the blue and black dress is really useful as a sort of tool for this because it's a great example of just driving home that people literally see the world differently. And if you can kind of understand that that's the case for something as simple as, as that, uh, you know, that opens a little wedge by which you might be able to deeply grasp, not just at a sort of abstract level that other people have different views, but deeply grasp the, the fact that not just people have different beliefs, but they really, really believe that is the case, that that is true in exactly the same way that we might uh, you know, find it impossible to, to understand that somebody sees uh, the dress differently. So it's all about opening so, but, but, this space. But why do you, so why do, you, why do you think then that we don't like them still, right? I mean, we still like, so we might, we might accept that they can see the, the dress or the world through a different lens, but we don't like them, do we? I don't know, actually. I don't think anybody asked that question. I'm not sure the yellow gold dress people dislike the blue black uh, dress people. Um, no, if we take any, if we take any of the political issues or major social issues, um, I think I think it's pretty clear that we that we have a disparaging view of people that have a different opinion on something that we that we think matters a lot. I, I guess it can be. I mean, this is now moving definitely out of my my wheelhouse a bit. But but I think it's one, one thing. This is a little bit anecdotal. Then I'll pass it on. Is, is just yeah. how you know, when I was when I was growing up, basically I was I think I was surrounded by people who had the general sort of political views that, that I did. But then I moved to San Diego when I was in my uh, mid twenties. And suddenly there, I was surrounded by people with very different political views. Or, mm. or, or, and I, I found that the most incredibly enlightening experience because it was the first time that I actually liked people who held very different uh, views to me. And that, that made it much easier to understand the perspective that they were, they were coming from, I guess, for, for obvious reasons that you know, you're more willing to, to take yeah, on yeah. board and to listen in, in those cases. So, you know, okay. that's one okay. prescription. Everybody should move to San Diego. Okay, well, that's that's not a bad idea for everybody. Um, Basana, absent of doing that, um, Anil's a bit odd, isn't he? Because um, most of the time we don't we don't like a different opinion, do we? No, and I, and I think it comes back to my my question to you before the technical nightmare. Um, is it really the belief that's doing the work? So a lot of these beliefs are tied to people's identities. Oh. So people believe what they do because it marks them as a good member of their group. And going back to even incidents like the blue black dress, right? Like we've shown in social psychology for decades with minimal group paradigms where you arbitrarily divide people into in groups and out groups based on random things like, do you see a blue or black dress? Um, there isn't necessarily animosity, but what there is is this bias or favoritism towards the in-group. So beliefs that we hold among the in-group now can become sacred, right? Because they are markers of our identity as group members. And therefore, it's not, in my opinion, it's not really about the belief per se. It's right. about the position that we're taking as a group. And the belief is one of the ways we mark that position, right? It's sort of our signaling process to other groups that might take a different belief. But as you saw, for instance, in the US with QAnon and those ridiculous conspiracy theories, right? Phenomena like that continue to happen in, in human society because belonging to the group is really what's important for those people, right? Having other people like them. And the belief is just one way in which you're like me, right? We're alike in many other ways. And right. so I think we can sometimes get focused in on the beliefs, particularly if we're coming from an academic perspective, because we think people are logical and we can just reason them out of this ridiculous belief by showing them evidence and facts. And that's not going to be effective. It really hasn't been effective. And so, yes, in a sense, you're right, Anil, you're a bit of an outlier. 
you're an academic, right? So you're open to different interpretations. But for most people, protecting their identity is really important, right? That's what gives us a sense of self. It gives us a positive view of ourselves, a lens through which to view the world, a place within the world of purpose. Protecting that is crucial. And so beliefs are going to play a huge role there. Yeah, thank you. I wouldn't be so, I, 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 I think a lot of academics are not, uh, are not <laughs> like Anil. Um, but uh, just, just, just a question then, really about these identities. Then, if we do we obviously we want a a narrative of ourselves that's consistent and coherent, um, and we hate being in you know that 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 sort of chaos and the complexity of the real world. Does that make it harder then for us to to see other sides or to break down some of these silos that might 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 exist because the identity needs to be reinforced? In a sense, I, I don't think it makes it harder per se. So I think everyone is capable of that metacognitive task Anna mentioned where I could evaluate the fact that I have this belief, but I think that's really key, right? Because that evaluation marks me as a good group member. And, mm. and that's really what I think is, is important. So in terms of breaking down silos, I'm not breaking down a silo with you because we're trying to reconcile our beliefs. Right, I'm doing that because there's a common goal we have in mind. Maybe there's a purpose we're trying to pursue. There has to be something else that motivates us to put aside our ideological differences or identity-based differences right. and, and work together. And that's not, <laughs> that's probably not gonna be stimulating intellectual debate, right? I'm not gonna put my <laughs> beliefs aside for that. And Tiffany can tell us lots of reasons why we're not gonna do that, right? Why the emotions are sort of going to always trump the sort of cognitive reasoned arguments. And so we have to think if we want to break down silos about common purposes, common goods. And that's an, an old story in social psychology and the neuroscience bears it out as well. All right, brilliant. Thank you so much. I'm going to move to a social psychologist again now. So um, Jen, what are some of these you know, social factors that are at play then in these, in these polarized issues? Sure. Um... Just kind of building on off and and to to make you happy paul disagreeing with some of it a little bit um um uh, what uh, the really good points lasana and anil be made i agree that i think there's different kinds of beliefs right and certain kinds of beliefs especially when it's about describing the world and kind of what's going on they are definitely or about what what's a maybe a moral value and, and what justifies it i think they're definitely these kind of post hoc justifications or signals they can very often just kind of serve that purpose of um of getting you some social benefits for your group but i do think that some fundamental ideological beliefs are based in core preferences about how people should relate to each other we generally study that in political psychology in terms of what do you think about inequality are you okay with it should it be greater should it be less and also what do you think about tradition versus change um, and so in, in some of our work recently we've shown how just that those basic relational preferences about inequality they shape not only how much inequality you say there is in the world, but how much you're actually picking up on these basic visual cognitive tasks. Exactly as Anil says, you know, in, in tasks where you just have to change, notice a tiny little detail difference between two pictures. Um, if, if you care about inequality, you're, you're picking up much more information about inequality from the world. And if let you me, don't- sorry, let me, Jen, Jen, let me just interrupt you there because I, I, I say context matters more than any other two words as, as, as anyone knows who's, who's heard me teach. And I say it a lot on the podcast series. Where does context fit in that description of either you see the world, like the, how you see inequality? Is it, I mean, presumably context matters there too. Well, two different ways. I mean, one is like how you get at these, these basic ideological differences, uh, the context of your childhood um, affects them. Also the context that you live in. So if I have a lot of money, I'm going to be more in favor of inequality than if I've got less money. Group factors will matter. But I think another key point about this is that the same context will be experienced by people differently. So if you and I are walking down the street, and we might be more or less likely to pick up on cues of inequality depending on, on how much we care about it. And that seems to be much more kind of basic than we had thought. And that's that's problematic because it means that, um, you know, it's when the left and the right are getting frustrated with each other, like, you know, how are you ignoring all these inequalities? How are you okay with it? Versus uh, you're just trumping up inequalities. You're seeing social justice issues everywhere. That actually might be that they're seeing different worlds in the first place. But I also just wanted to build on, on what Lasana said in terms of group membership kind of get us beyond this. Um, I think it, to the extent that um, our group membership becomes overlapping with our ideology, then we're really in trouble because, um, because then it means that for the sake of my group, I also need to hold on to these ideological preferences even strongly. What we need to try to arrive at is a kind of a group that's a society, some kind of like common good where you've got 
multiple ideological preferences and, and kind of plurality of perspectives, um, as Hannah Arendt has talked about, and everybody's coming together for the sake of that common ground. And so I think what's worrying now is that whereas previously maybe group identities were more based on um, class or region, now group identity seems to be quite ideological. So there's no way that you can have difference within that group. Right. Great. Thank you. Um, let's come to you, Tiffany. Um, is this all? Is, is, is this always been the case? Because of, 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 I, I sort of think about whether we're talking about our polarized culture as if like it's a recent phenomenon. Um, of course, it isn't, is it? No, I'm, I'm sure you're right. I mean, I'm sure I'm sure the Romans were arguing over their pizza toppings too, and <laughs> coming to blows over <laughs> over which which one was better. Um, I'm sure this is you know part of part of the way we are as human beings because you know as we've heard it, it matters a great deal to us um what group we're in in terms of in terms of how we think about ourselves and who we think we are and whether we think not just whether we think we're right but whether we think we matter and how also we make sense of ourselves i mean we talk about our sort of meanness we talk about our identity um and in in very simple ways you know as if it's as if it's just me but actually our identity as we know is extremely complex and has very, many different facets and and one of those aspects is, is about the groups that we belong to um i was thinking today about how many different forms of group identity i have and that depends so much on the context of who i'm talking to so for example you know i'm a londoner so if i talk to someone from northern ireland that my londoner is my identity but if i talk to someone from north london then i'm a south londoner and if i talk to someone who lives in the next street to me then no i live in this street so I, there's these ways in which we kind of create these little groups uh, in order to kind of make sense of our experience and to make sense of ourselves within it. And they matter to us. Um, they matter to us emotionally um, and they matter to the, the ways in which we think of ourselves as humans. And I think that that sense of mattering is the thing that we need to pay attention to. Um, certainly we've always been in groups and we've always had rivalries and antagonisms, but, but the way we've thought about how those groups work, that has changed quite a lot over the 19th and 20th century. Um, in the 19th century, if you asked a psychologist about group behavior, they, they would talk about mobs and crowds, they would talk about people getting kind of swept up in irrational group contagious emotions. Um, they would think that uh, you became a kind of automaton if you got yourself into a kind of group situation, whether that was in person or whether that was a kind of set of collective beliefs. And so they saw this behavior as fundamentally irrational. And actually, you know, when I read newspaper articles about protests, um, I still hear that language. You know, you still hear these very outdated ways of thinking still are around in the public conversation today. You know, the way that I've learned that psychologists and, and sociologists talk about groups is much more sophisticated now. Um, they're not talking about forms of irrational, um, wholly emotional kind of, um, uh, connections with other people that happen in a in a kind of contagious way they're thinking about the ways in which the connections we make with other people matter to us in terms of our identity anyway i think that that's just really important to bear in mind that, th that, that this matters on a very rational level as well okay thank you i was just i was just thinking about the signaling uh, uh comment that lasagna made or just you know generally we signal our identities or the groups that we belong to um and whether we I sometimes wonder, you know that saying about people take kindness as a sign of weakness. I think sometimes, do you not think we can take acceptance of difference as a sign of not holding a view strongly enough? The idea that, you know, I, it's, 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 it's very difficult to simultaneously feel strongly about something and accept that someone could disagree with you. I think this is such a great point. I was thinking about exactly this before I came on because you know, often in these things, you know, in podcasts, and, and in fact, this is, you know, the question was asked a bit earlier, well, doesn't anyone disagree? You know, you've got to have a strong opinion. And often I'm someone who doesn't actually often have very strong opinions. And I often find myself trying to come up with a strong opinion in order to participate in exactly this kind of format. And I was thinking exactly about why we request people to have strong opinions and what it is in our, you know, in our public conversation that demands that. I was thinking about how, I'm, I've got quite young children and when I first became a mum 
I suddenly found myself absorbed, well, not absorbed, but sort of surrounded by this very polarized, you know, what's called the mummy wars, you know, are you breastfeeding your baby or are you using formula? Are you like, you know, sleep training your baby or are you kind of waking up every 30 seconds to, to, to set it down? You know, like there's all of these very polarized ways in which you can raise children. And it's very easy, very easy, if you spend any time online or reading these articles to get swept up in this very antagonistic way of thinking. And it's very easy, you know, even for someone like me to kind of think oh you know who cares about organic rice cakes just give them some you know jelly beans you know so so you can get yourself into this very polarized sort of way of thinking um so i was also wanting to ask myself you know what is at stake when we when we want people to to be polarized when we want to separate them you know these mummy wars you know that's something that's been created by the the media you know we don't have to have it we, but once it's there we get sucked into it so what you know who creates these polarizations and uh, and what's at stake for them when they create them yeah cool thank you anyone else want to come in on that I, mean, I suppose on mummy wars <laughs> but, um, <laughs> not necessarily on mummy wars <laughs> but my, my observation from my own kind of you know combat experience there is um that social class plays a big role um and uh, especially in terms of um the difference between people who've got um the time and the resources to be able to um be as patient as as forever with their child get them the most organic and best and home cooked and this and that uh, um food and, and those who don't have it. And then, and that's often how it, differences in society come about, especially around lifestyle, less ideological differences, but difference about lifestyle and life decisions that we make. Mm. Usually they start from um, kind of decisions that are talked about as if they're better um, in kind of upper echelons of society, backed up by the resources that come with that and the opportunity that that gives people to distinguish themselves from people who are not doing as well as them. And then they kind of trickle down through snobbery and, and judgment, which is something I know um, Paul's already talked a lot about through the podcast really well. Yeah, thank you. And thank you for drawing everyone's attention to the podcast again. Um, there's an issue on class and there's also an episode on uh, fit or fat, which is really about how we judge uh, how other people's behave, um, particularly in relation to lifestyle and social class. Um, I just thought I just thought come to this. It's really interesting because one of the things that I I agree with you, Tiffany, is on the, on some things I either I either don't have a strong view or I'm very confused about what I think my view should be. And I just wonder whether we're we're not allowed to signal that, right? Um, especially as academics, is whether we have to be very clear and certain about the evidence and about about what we know to be true, and to sort of come come out and say, "But well, you know what? I don't I don't actually really know." Um, makes you look weak. Anno? Yeah, I think there's something right about that, that there is this implicit pressure to, to not change one views, one's views radically um, in a number of contexts. In academia, certainly, it, it's quite hard. And uh, it's, you know, I actually think it's becoming more broadly accepted and respected when people do change their minds you know we get back to this thing when the evidence changes i'll, I'll change my mind that classic classic quote but you, you just don't see it happen uh very often and so i'm i am interested in this i don't have an answer to it but part of it part of that resistance to changing one's mind even in a scientific context where you might think the evidence would just force the issue I mean, mm. part of that must come from the momentum a particular set of beliefs has the internal momentum of, of being part part of your uh, identity and then part of it might be exactly as you say that what's what's perceived as as strength and what's perceived as as weakness and there might even be a sort of trajectory to this that over time once you've sort of established a set of beliefs then it becomes more acceptable to change at least part of them because you've got certain parts of your identity that is stable mm. you know you can then maybe allow you know, other things other things to change and one thing that, that's just reflecting back a little bit, though, because I think a lot of what we've been talking about comes down to the importance of maintaining a coherent and relatively stable set of beliefs for one's sense of self. And what this make, keeps making me think is that that's only one part of what our experience of selfhood is about. And this connects very much with, with Tiffany's stuff on emotion. Like we, we have so many ways of experiencing being who we are. And many of them don't really in, extend to this social group level at all. You know, I experience having the body that I have. I experience being the, the author of my actions and, and thoughts. Um, 
I experience the world from from a perceptual perspective. And it strikes me that that somehow we've got into this, you know, maybe it's it's just because of the kind of animal we are. We tend to really emphasize one level of selfhood uh, over others. Interesting. Lasan, I think you want to come in there. Yeah, I think I think there are three very interesting points that we made. Um, and I'll try to hit all of them. Let's start with the most recent one about the idea of the self. You're absolutely right, Anna. Um, there's a lot of self that isn't necessarily tied up in other people. However, at least in social psychology, the argument is often made that the self is a social agent as well, right? So you can think about the relational self, how the self interact with other people. And so even if I might be having an interoceptive experience that's just about me, I'm going to start comparing that to other people and to my position within hierarchies. And, and it's the nature of the animal we are, right? We're hyper-social as a species. And so we're always considering other people, even our future and past selves as abstract external agents. Um, so factoring that into it, I think, complicates the conversation because now beliefs if I take them to be part of the self, right, they're literally, if you disagree with me, you don't like me, right? So it's not necessarily about this idea that's detached from me. It might become part of who I am. Um, why, why is this the case? Is it the case that this is happening more now than it did before? Um, a very cynical answer, because we're now stepping outside of my expertise, so I have a right to be cynical. A very cynical answer is that there's money in it. So the more polarization I can drum up, the more clicks I can get, the more, right? And so there are these independent systems like social media companies, et cetera, et cetera, that have for-profit motives and exploiting these disagreements is a way of boosting profit. And so that's one way of thinking about, well, why does it yeah, seem nice. to be more prevalent than before? Um, there are many other explanations, but I thought I'd throw some cynicism in there. Um, and then the, the third interesting point, which is really something I, I don't have a good answer for, um, surrounds this concept of trying to do something about it. So if I'm aware that I have a belief that sits in one camp versus another, let's take Brexit. I have a Brexit belief, but I don't feel very strongly about it, right? Like I'm happy either way. And if I look at some parts of uh, Brexit, I can see positive. If I look at some parts of remaining, I can see positive. So what do I do? That's where I think these social pressures are really, really important. And this context effect you mentioned are really, really important. So who am I surrounded with? What does my network look like? Where do I work, right? All of these aspects are now going to slightly nudge me in one direction versus another until it gets to the point where I have to make some kind of public declaration about my position. And now it's a commitment, right? And I have to be consistent in my beliefs. And so I become that person. So I can start off not being very feeling strongly one way or the other, but through the interactions I'm having with my group and my social environment, they're going to slightly push me one way or the other. So if yeah. we're thinking about change, that, that initial point where issues aren't as yet crystallized might be a place we want to come in and, and try to make these logical arguments, try to push people one way or the other. Yeah, thank you. Um, yeah, that's all been incredibly interesting. So I do think that it does, I, I don't know, I mean, I'm going to sound like a like I'm old now, which I am, but you know, it feels like we're we're increasingly being asked to take a side, even if we don't have like so, and and also actually assumed to be on the opposite side if we don't strongly endorse the side that someone else is on. Like you're kind of taken to be an extreme representation of the alternative if you express any degree of ambivalence. Um, but I'm going to move on. Thank you so much for the audience for bearing with us and showing their forbearance earlier on. Um, we're going to now do this word cloud uh, activity. Um, and what I'm going to do is, um, I think many of you may have seen the word clouds, at least the outputs from them, where the more of the same or similar words come up, the, the sort of larger they are on the screen. Um, and we're going to ask a question, and then I'm going to get the panel to reflect on it, is I could never be friends with someone with a different view on. And then you have to finish that sentence. I could never be friends with someone with a different view on. Since most of you aren't friends with people that disagree with you anyway, uh, that should be that should be a relatively easy question to answer. Um, there's a link that's, that's been sent by Rebecca at PBS um, that will that you can click on, and then um, at some point, I think Rebecca will share the screen, and we will we will see uh, what our participants make of that question and which words 
or which issues you can't agree with people on um, emerge as being the most prominent. Thank you everybody for participating in this. This is uh, it's nice seeing you in real time. I think I think we can see what's <laughs> we can see what's in the middle. We can see the but see the uh, where most people are. Uh, nothing. I like that as an answer. Pineapple on pizza. Someone's been primed by that one. I saw Boris Johnson a, a, a minute ago. He's disappeared. Well, he hasn't disappeared, obviously. He's disappeared from the screen. The value of books. Okay, shall we... Uh, Cool. So we're going, to, we're going to leave that up. Shall we leave that up? Let's leave that up for everybody to, to be able to see. And actually, people can start adding to it. Why don't I, rather than there's all, I just realized we were just all sitting here in silence looking at, I was just um, drawn by <laughs> what was changing on the screen. Um, let me come. Does anyone, does anyone want to come in on, on what they're seeing, either either as, as a surprise or reinforcing what they knew to be true already? Because, of course, we all know uh, the answer to that one, don't we? Um, does anyone want to come in? Yeah, Jen. I'm happy to do another plug for uh, <laughs> <laughs> there being two there being two key things that I think really do go deep in us in terms of how we think the world um, should work when we all live together. One is how okay are we with some people doing better off than others, and in particular some groups doing better off than others, which I think we can really see here with racism and gender equality mm. and human rights. And then the other is about tradition versus change, um, and. Um, about um, in particular kind of um, socially attitudes that fall around social conservatism and, and ideas of sacred values, especially around like life, they're on abortion, um, but maybe also um, openness to like what you think about authority also linked into the tradition and changes authority because I'm thinking about authoritarianism here. I think mm. that some kind of anti-authority views um, come out with vaccine hesitancy, for example. Um, so, and obviously religion on the tradition side, that, that's what I'm saying, interested to hear from others. Interesting, thank you, Jen. Anyone else? I wanted to pick up on one which is out there a little bit on the diagonal climate change, um, mm. which I think is kind of interesting because for me anyway, it's an example of where the polarization has become more finessed now. So it's, it's a bizarre thing to be optimistic about because I, I do think our, our, as a society, we're not doing a brilliant job of dealing with it. However, the discourse in many spheres now has changed from complete polarization, it's not happening, it's the end of the world, to much more stratified range of views about what we should do in response. And this can be very dramatic, or it can be less dramatic. And I find that as, as, as something of an optimism, like we've had these, these uh, initiatives like climate uh, assemblies, uh, run by a friend of mine, Becky Willis on climate change, where you get people from society to you know, to really figure out, okay, what would we do? How would we solve these, these problems and take ownership of, of certain ideas? And sort of that for me is a great way to address uh, diversity of views because you're not asking people to convince each other about their starting points. You're asking them to approach a kind of common end goal from different starting points. And mm. so I think that it's perfectly possible to be friends now with people who would have different views about climate change because it's become perhaps less polarized mm, interesting you mean different i mean the acceptance that it's happening but what we should do about it right that's right that's right i mean there will still be some some views that say it's it's, it's not happening or that it's not uh generated by human activity but those are increasingly 
uh, in a minority. And then it's sort of very interesting to, to understand why those beliefs might still persist. But the majority of, of discourses is now moved on to what do we do about it? And that can range from nothing to everything. But also we are we are looking at a very particular group of people who are, you know, who have come here to listen to this conversation. And what would that word cloud look like if it was in America, you know, for example, or if it was in certain parts of America, you know, um, you know, I completely agree with you. It looks very optimistic with climate change. Um, but, you know, in some arenas, climate change is, you know, it's a culture war. You know, it is very polarized issue. Um, so. So I think the context, as as with all of these things, you know, matters. Yeah, thank you. Um, it's an interesting question about vaccines. Um, the, again, I think this is an example of where you you kind of you almost seem to represent the extreme view of being. But if you if you if you exercise any if you, if you express any degree of concern about the pace of vaccine rollout and the idea that we should be vaccinating children, um, that you may immediately be accused of being anti-vax, which clearly isn't, which clearly isn't the case for most of those people. Um, and I wonder whether there, you know, this used to be, um, we've always had faith, you know, there's been faith, people have a lot of faith about God, um, but there's also faith in science as well, isn't there? That's become a belief based system as well, that, that science is always, that science is always right. I just wonder as academics, what you, what you think to that, because that becomes polarized too, doesn't it? Is the idea that, you know that site that, that that we have this faith um as as other people do as, as some people do about as some people might about god there's a faith in science and faith in evidence well there should be right <laughs> i would say that as a, i think science is very different in in its in its role in society it's not that every obviously it's not the case that everything published in a journal should be believed uncritically probably most things in most academic journals are wrong and facts are, are provisional what science provides is a method and you, uh, so from a personal perspective i have a strong belief in science as a method for getting to where we need to be on a number of issues that doesn't mean that i believe everything that that has been yeah i suppose i suppose i'm thinking that. about that i was thinking about that sort of maybe maybe a bit more specifically in the context of having the social psychologist with us as well in the context of um well actually all of you um many studies that haven't been replicated in the psychological literature where something will be taken as as evidence and will be taken as science because it's been published in a good journal but there's a failure to replicate those findings and whether and whether some of that replication crisis is actually driven by our faith in the evidence um i think i think science wants to be proven wrong and that's what makes science right. I think different, right? So right. as a scientist, you're having a good day if you're proven wrong, because that's advanced knowledge, right? Because your state of knowledge at that point in time was X. X I'm gonna, I'm gonna hold that thought when someone proves me wrong. I'm gonna I'm gonna say that. I'm gonna thank you for that. But but the problem <laughs> is we're human beings doing science. <laughs> and as human beings, we have all of these social motives around not wanting to be wrong, wanting to appear intelligent, wanting to appear competent. So I think science as an abstract thing is fine, right? How science is used by us human beings, how it's performed by us human beings and how it's interpreted is where the problems arise, right? And so I think it's okay to have faith in science or belief in science as a methodology, but then the debates are about the specific scientists, right? So for instance, yeah. take the vaccines. There's debate about which vaccines are actually effective and which are not, right? So if Chinese scientists have developed a vaccine, that's not seen as effective as if American researchers developed a vaccine, right? And, and that has nothing to do with the science. No one has evaluated the science, right? We're using these social factors to judge. And I think that's really what's, what's happening with a lot of these issues, right? The facts go out the window and the people associated with the facts become much relevant. And so are we doing a good job in lockdown? Well, it depends on how we feel about our political leadership. And if we're happy with them, we think we are. And if we're not, we don't, right? So this relationship of people to facts is, is really, I think, also worth exploring in this. And I think science really illustrates that nicely. Yeah, thank you. Um, and listen, thank you. Thank you. I'm trying to, we've tried to, I've tried to foster this kind of conversation that we're having rather than this being panel, you know, where people speak at length and then you wait for someone else to take their turn and talk. So. Thank you. This is actually, I think, working really well. Um, 
So thank you for that. I'm going to now move to um, some questions from the audience for our last sort of segment. Um, it's always good to get some engagement. And, and uh, again, thank you for staying with us and also asking the questions. Um, so I'm going to just, just uh, I have no idea whether this is going to be a good question or not. I'm just going to read it out and then you're, you can make it a really good one um, from, your, from your answers. And I'm sure this is a really good one from Peter. It says, is it significant that younger people seem more ready to passionately adopt a new belief system in politics or religion? So maybe just generally on maybe something about age and cohort effects, perhaps. Yes, I just wasn't sure whether that was true. Is that is that true that young people adopt their stronger political views in a more whimsical or dramatic way? Any evidence that speaks to the point? I mean, it's really difficult, I mean, as, as we all know, to separate our age and cohort effects. Um, do we? Is there any significant evidence on, on either um, about polarization if, across I any issue we, generally? I think the questionnaire might be motivated by the participation of younger people in a lot of the social justice movements around things like Extinction Rebellion and Black Lives Matter. Yeah. They're very visible and they're, they're leading on environmental issues in lots of cases. But I think we've seen that before, right? Like in the 70s in the US, you saw sort of that young generation pushing for things like the Vietnam War and getting rid of it. So I think there's always a, a passion amongst younger people to mm. take on these issues. I think that's something we've always seen. Um, I think we're seeing it a lot now because we have a lot of issues. Um, and so there's a lot of room for young people, right? There's this existential threat with the environment where they're the ones seeing the impacts as they live on after we're gone. And so absolutely, I think we're seeing it now on those issues, but for young people in general, I think it's the norm. As to why that happens, um, developmentally, I think um, we're very much influenced by our peers when we're younger and we're in our adolescence and young adulthood. And if our peers are all involved in a social justice movement, we're more likely to go along. So that might be one explanation. Um, younger people are also usually the ones with um, uh, more flexibility and their scheduling, right? And so they can be more visible than most of us who have to run, pick up the kids and do all of the other things that come around. So there are, there are probably many factors that explain it. I don't think there's a change necessarily. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Um, I've got a nice question here is why it sort of speaks to something that we were talking about earlier that, I, that I've been intrigued by for a while is, is why society is so quick to judge and put labels on people. Um, I, get, I mean, obviously, there'd be good uh, both cognitive and social psychological reasons for doing that. Maybe uh, you, uh, some of our panel might, members might want to elaborate a bit more on that with a view to the reason I ask that is it, it draw attention to that with a view to thinking about how we might do more to break those down because I think that's really what I wanted to start moving towards you know further exp exploration in the time that we have left on on what we might do to break down some of these barriers Jen thanks yeah I was just going to um I was just going to say that because uh, often we do end up a bit pessimistic about this when we think about what I would call our coalitional psychology or our groupish psychology you know the fact that we're, we're just kind of the tiniest thing and we'll suddenly put someone in a group but I think what's exciting is research that shows just how malleable that actually is so it's not necessarily that there's a particular set of group memberships that need to be key you might um, even though um, you know histories of history of colonialism and kind of differences, other kind of differences in people's daily lives will make some more salient than others. There is research that shows that if you switch um, the criteria along which people cooperate versus compete, and you, for example, have um, multiracial teams competing against each other, as opposed to um, a black and a white team, you can actually shift um, the way the brain is categorizing and thinking about people. And to me, that's quite hopeful because ultimately coalitional psychology is about figuring out who's with me and who's against me. And um, so the challenge then as a society is to try to um, send out cues that we're all in this together, that we're all interdependent and everybody is with me and that there aren't other kind of smaller um, smaller scale uh, group divisions that uh, decide these kind of boundaries of cooperation versus competition. So even though it's fundamental, what's fundamental is the groupishness, not necessarily any particular group distinction, um, bearing in mind that some will be accentuated by um, highly patterned distributions of resources and power, which are sometimes hard to butch. Brilliant, thank you. I've got both Tiffany and Anna with their hands up. So Tiffany and Anna. Yes, well, I, I think that's absolutely brilliant. 
and um, completely makes sense. But I also wanted to go back to something that Lasana was saying about the about the internet and the ways in which we're encouraged to hold these polarized views, you know, for commercial gain, you know, so that these particular platforms that we, you know, that really dominate our, our lives nowadays are, are, are very unmonitored and there's and there's no sense of which they're taking responsibility for the ways in which they, you know, encourage very powerfully polarized opinions and um and and, and financially benefit from them. So you know you said maybe it's cynical I don't think it's cynical at all you know I think that's absolutely what's happening um and so uh, it, so paying attention to that pay uh, and, and increasing kind of ways in which we can monitor that um situation I think w is is another way in which we can be more optimistic and hopeful about overcoming some of those um, prejudices and barriers so I'm going to be pessimistic having been optimistic earlier and I mean <laughs> this I think what you what you said uh, Jennifer about encouraging ways where we all feel that we're in it together and interdependence rather than competitive. One would have thought that the COVID-19 pandemic would have been precisely the spur to that. And a relatively, you know, as bad as it has been, it could have been much worse you know, as a sort of dry run for how to, to bridge differences and realize that we all have to face this together. And that's, that's the only way and to, to, to do it. It's the, it's the kind of perfect opportunity. Um, and we have royally screwed that up as a world, I think, in, in many ways. Some countries have done better than others, but it was pointed out, you, know, you pointed out earlier, uh, Lissana, about different vaccines having different interpretations because of political beliefs. It's been weaponized. It's been, it's been um, just, it certainly hasn't been uh, the dress rehearsal that we all wanted so that when the real existential threat comes around, whether it's a, a much more virulent, pandemic or aliens invading from Mars or, or, or spiraling out of control climate change when we finally uh, tip over the edge of whatever cliff is we're heading to. You know, we, we, we haven't done very well. So I think uh, a, there's enormous opportunity now to reflect on why that didn't work. What, how do we get it so globally wrong in bringing us together in the face of, of this COVID-19? Yeah, interesting. I just one thing comes to comes to mind with that is except is uh, uh, I'll be careful. How I'm going to say this, um, but is like the kind of we're all in it together lines are tapping into our pro sociality, um, and I think often at the exclusion of the selfishness that motivates much of human action. And I think sometimes we have these narratives. I obviously talk about this in Happy Ever After some to some extent to, to some large extent in the chapter on altruism that we don't seem to be willing to accept the fact that we are um, in large part selfish. And so kind of acceptance of some of these basic human parts of the basic human condition would actually make it easier, not harder for us to address some of these wider social issues. I wonder what, wonder what you make of that. Yeah, I think that's a challenge, isn't it? So this idea of preference alignment, that you want to somehow incentivize and, and make people's uh, individual desires map onto what's what's best for society at large I, I mean how you do that it's way out of my wheelhouse but I think that identifies the pro and I completely accept you're right you, you don't get very far just by denying very central aspects of human nature yeah and I think it speaks again to to the points that Lasana made and then Tiffany picked up on is where are the incentives I mean there are there are very good questions that we haven't really properly addressed not just financial incentives of course but but motivational ones as well um you want to come back in both of you I think yeah, I just, I, I really just wanted to pick up on that point because I think it's an, yeah. an excellent one. The idea that the pandemic would be a panacea for what ails us um, is a nice one in theory, but in reality, we still live in a divided world, right? So when we're starting from that baseline, these challenges aren't going to lift us out of it. They're going to exacerbate them. Um, and so if anything, the pandemic has highlighted our need to get our act together. In, in ways that we didn't anticipate we would need to before. And, and that's a, a positive of it. The, the reason for optimism comes from who we are as a species, like humans are hyper cooperative, like we're really social. What, what gave us the ability to dominate the planet is our ability to work together in groups. Um, and so at our core, we're, we're really, really cooperative and, and pro-social, however, that pro-sociality occurred under very different circumstances when our brains evolved and we became homo sapiens. Now we live in a perversion of that system where 
opportunities for cooperation come with much higher risks than they did when we were simple hunter-gatherers. And so the push towards being more selfish is something I think that has happened more recently in our evolutionary history. Not to say that human beings have not always been horrible and vicious. We always have. But we've always mm -hmm. done a good job of protecting our group, right, and making sure that our group thrives. And now our group has become every human being on this planet. We're having a hard time doing that. Um, so I think we have the basic architecture to pull it off, but we've been pushed through modernization to a point where um, individualism, as one of the questioners mentioned, is something that is now dominant in our societies. And maybe we need to start sort of thinking around that. But there, there is hope for optimism. Like we got this far because we were pro-social. Um, and we need to remember that as well. Cool, thank you. Tiffany, do you want to put it there something? Yeah, I just wanted to say that this kind of we're all in it together rhetoric, you know, I, I think it speaks actually to Jennifer's research really nicely because it lands so differently depending on who it comes from and where it ends up. You know, if you, if you have Boris Johnson saying we're all in this together, but then he's kind of like, you know, giving his mates contracts and things, then we don't feel that we're all in it together at all. What we feel like is that he's in it and then we're sort of serving his view, you know, or his his game, you know. And so and so when we talk, when we have these kind of ideas of cooperation, I think we have to kind of filter them through the lens, which doesn't say, well, we're just all selfish and that's just what we like as humans, but to say something slightly more nuanced, which is that, you know, there is a lot at stake when we cooperate and different people have different things at stake. You know, some people are more vulnerable. They have much more to lose. Some people have a lot to gain when we all cooperate. If we don't kind of notice, I mean, this is Jennifer's research really, but if we don't notice those differences, you know, then we then we kind of fall into this trap of saying, oh, we're just all selfish, we can't get along. That's not true. You know, we can cooperate, but we have to make sure that the cooperation is happening um, with equality in mind rather than with some people benefiting and other people giving up. Yeah, great, thank you. Um, I apologize, I can't get to everyone's questions. I'm gonna ask one final question because I'm conscious of time and then now Simon to come back in at the end. And I think Simon will like my own answer to this question that's coming is uh, from Louise at the LSE, Louise Jones. Can we, can the panel give an example of one thing that in spite of all their knowledge of what's driving them to feel it, really winds them up about someone else thinking differently or doing the opposite. And I've got the answer to this question. As I, as I, as I spent all of my life saying how we should be tolerant and respectful and accepting difference. I just find it hard to respect parents whose children don't support the same football team as them. I just, I just can't bring myself to have respect for parents whose kids don't support the same, same team as them. My kids were given the choice of whether they wanted to support West Ham or now Brighton, because that's where we live. But it wasn't really a choice. They knew, they knew what the right answer to that was. And could I love them as much if they were to support Brighton? I doubt it. Who's next? I think this really depends on what you know the the the, the irritations in your life for me I, I my main irritation at the moment is people who cycle on the pavement grown-ups who cycle on the pavement rather than in the road so anyone who thinks they're entitled to cycle on the pavement when I am trying to walk along the pavement with my dog uh, in the morning then uh, you know they, they there is no there's no amount of anger and animosity that I can't uh, restrain to those people do you do you ever cycle on the pavement no no, of course not. Because I wonder, because I wonder if some of these things sometimes are reflections of ourself, right? So some of the some of the things that we really most dislike about other people are things that this this is. That might, by the way, that West Ham example isn't one of these. Uh, but I think there's lots of examples of where the things that we most dislike about other people are actually uh, reflections of the things that we like least about ourselves. Um, Jen, Anil, Masana. I guess that I was just going to say, you know, it's the one thing that really winds me up is when people choose the football team they'll support, depending on where they happen to be currently living. Uh, like moving from West Ham to, to Brighton being one example. Um, no, that's, that's, that's obviously glib. I also have done the same, but I don't respect myself for it. Why do I support Brighton when I didn't, when I haven't lived here? All my all my life, it's. A, I'm glad. See, look, so we're moving right. into this place where we get people to question and challenge that you know their 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 selves, their core identities. You know, this is this is this is really where we're heading. We're really making some progress today, Jen. Uh, yeah, I guess I guess what what bugs me is um, 
people who um, who get offended by uh, wanting to debate something, right? So it's kind of like right right to the core of what we want to do is uh, you just kind of want to discuss an issue, and it's hard for it to be about the issue itself than about like the two egos involved. So so then so you know so then the discussion becomes about oh, well that's you or that's because you're that type or that's because you're in that group, and it seems that things like loyalty. And matter more than kind of what we're discussing and I think that's probably just my kind of hopeless maybe kind of rationalist humanist wishing that we could all just leave those behind and have these conversations and um, so I, I'm victim to the the very same frustrations I think that that are leading us to have this discussion in the first place yeah thank you um it's interesting there's an interesting question about loyalty there though isn't there because it doesn't it doesn't play so much into you know, we are both interested in social class it doesn't play so much into middle class values as it does to working class values um, and so I think maybe there's a there's there's an important issue of the lens that that's looked at through too. I think. Um, yeah. So it, it's yeah. I was just going to tap onto the moral foundation stuff as well. I mean, just in general, the notion of the group and of loyalty as some kind of like valid means of evaluating someone's behaviour is is denigrated um, by um, by liberals and middle, particularly middle class liberals. I think there's this yeah. class and ideology there. Yeah, cool, there might you. be a question about yes. how, how we characterize it. Loyalty has this very, obviously, very strong kind of sense of moral duty to it. Um, but but on the set, you know, regardless, I think, of, 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 which, of how you were brought up or how you even think about it, people do still display preferences to groups, you know, and, and display them in the most kind of seemingly irrational ways. You know, when you put up that um, pizza questionnaire at the beginning, and I, I, I like pineapple so I ticked pineapple and I noticed that most people had ticked pineapple but you said that it was only sorry yeah yeah right <laughs> so, so there's like these ridiculous little ways in which we kind of want to kind of claim our space and claim our identity and, and experience that as forms of loyalty although you know if you had asked me are you feeling loyal to the to the pineapple on pizza people, I would have said, no, of course not, you know, but, but and yet there I was feeling slightly aggrieved on our account that we were being overlooked. I'm so sorry. Uh, uh, it's taken you all this time to, to, to bear your soul on that. I'm sorry, a whole hour has passed and you've been keeping it inside. It's been hurting you all this time. Thank you for sharing it. Lasana. Uh, I'll be quick. Uh, people who don't consider others. I mean, I feel like as a human being, you're not on this planet alone. There are other people around you. They're not just means to an end. There are other people with experiences pay attention. So when someone is walking in the middle of the street and they just stop to chat on their phone or to dig in their purse or bag or whatever reason, it really pisses me off, right? There are people walking behind you. Pay attention. Brilliant. Thank you so much. That's a, that's a good note on which to finish. Simon, are you there? <laughs> He's I been there here. all the time. I mean, Brilliant. Fascinating discussion. I mean, I, I wanted to jump in at so many points as a <laughs> as a political scientist. I mean, a couple you've of got things. a couple of minutes at the end that you can you can have liberty now to to yeah. Kind of I mean, I found, the, I found the word cloud really fascinating. I mean, it's good, from, isn't it? From, I study voting and and uh, party behavior and this kind of stuff, and we have a sort of conception of politics that says that you know we have an economic dimension of politics, sort of economic left right issues, and we have a cultural dimension of politics and that word cloud sort of reinforces my own view of this, which is, you know, the economic issues are more fungible. So, you know, we didn't see on that issue, you know, I disagree with people who think we shouldn't spend more money on healthcare, or I disagree with, you know, I, I can never be friends with someone who thinks we that we should cut taxes, or I would never be friends with someone who thinks we should raise taxes. I mean, so those sorts of classic economic dimension of politics, we is not there. Uh, it, it, and that probably allows that to be more fungible, whereas th these are all cultural issues and, and have, as political scientists, we think of often these cultural issues as not so fungible, much harder to reach agreement or compromise on this cultural dimension. And that's partly why I think we're seeing that polarization. A, a second sort of question I have, which I don't have an answer to, is, is, is it possible to have political polarization without effective polarization? Meaning, can we have kind of vastly different views on a particular political issue without it feeding through to a sort of, I hate you because you have those views. I mean, is it, how, how, can we get to a situation where people can have really radically different views about cultural issues, but, but still actually say, it's legitimate for you to have that view that I really radically disagree with. I'm not sure. I don't think so. I mean, I, which feeds which? Is it, is it, is, is, are we getting that effective polarization because we have that political polarization and, and on non-fungible issues? And I think, I don't know what the answer to that is. Anyway, fascinating discussion. 
Um, I would say, you know, in, I think it should be a broad discussion across the social sciences, because I think other people have interesting things to bring to the table. I'm sure my economist colleagues here would, would say the same, but, but thank you all very much. It was a great discussion, great podcast. And you can listen to the podcast or download the podcast from anyone, any, any way you you'd normally consume your podcast. And I think, Paul, you're about to load up a new one tonight. Is that right? Yes, thank uh, you very much. I think we are. We've got we've got a couple more episodes coming. For those that have, haven't listened to the first five, please do so. Uh, we've got one coming on gender, and then one coming on life expectancy, end of end of life, um, and then a third one on general issues that we've been discussing today. So thank you, Paul, and thank you to the audience for, for participating, and thank you, colleagues, for a, a great discussion. Bye. Yeah, thank you all so very much. It's been fantastic.